Hello, it's Martin at Wisely Automotive. It's the first Saturday after the Christmas holidays. We are back in the office, but it's still pretty quiet. So I thought I would show you around our latest purchase. Before I do that, I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. If you ordered any of the Wisely Automotive i3 calendars, they should have been with you before the Christmas day. And on behalf of the entire team, I want to wish you a happy 2022. But let's talk about the cars now. So as you can probably guess from the title of this video, this is going to be the highlight of this vlog. It's a Renault Zoe Riviera edition. And I have lined it up next to the i3 because despite them being originally targeted at a different audience, now on the second hand market the prices are becoming quite close between the two, depending obviously on the age and specification. So quite a few of our customers are cross shopping the two. Let's start with the Zoe then. It is based on the new shape of the Zoe, so the ZE50, which as the name suggests has a 52 kilowatt hour battery. The official WLTP range on it is 238 miles, but realistically we would say you can expect between 170 and 200. Under the bonnet, all Riviera editions come with the R135 motor, so that's a 100 kilowatt or just under 135 horsepower motor. And if we look at the charge port, this being the new Zoe, it features the CCS plug for DC rapid charging up to 50 kilowatts. Because it's limited to 50 kilowatts and it has quite a large battery pack, especially for its size, it takes about an hour for an 80% charge, but still that's an improvement compared to the previous Zoe. You get more range and the CCS plug definitely future-proofs the car as the number of CCS rapid chargers has definitely picked up, especially in the past year. Before I continue, I should also probably point out that both of these cars are not yet fully prepared. So if you want to see how our cars look when they are ready for sale and what's done to them, I will leave that in the card above. The Riviera edition is a limited edition of the Zoe. Only 300 are available in the UK and all of them come in this night blue color. It's very similar to the BMW Midnight Blue Metallic. An easy way of spotting the Riviera is that they come with this stripe on the side, starting from the front headlight, continuing all the way down the side panels, ending right here in the back. In the UK, probably all Rivieras were registered as 2021 cars, as you can see from the number plate. So it is a very fresh, almost fully spec Zoe. I can start from the front. You probably already know that all Zoes get full LED headlights as standard. That means that unlike the previous generation, which only had LED daytime running lights, in this one, the dipped beam and high beam are both LED. Moving on, I already mentioned the CCS rapid charging. The front grille has these diamond elements, very similar to Mercedes AMG cars. It looks really smart, especially in combination with the dark blue color. Moving down the side, we can see that in addition to the front and rear parking sensors, there are also side mounted ultrasonic sensors for the park assist feature and in fact I've explored the menus a bit and it seems like it can do a lot of maneuvers so if it stays quiet today I will take the car out to test it out. In terms of wheels we've got 16 inch diamond cut alloys. Diamond cut means that the whole wheel is painted black and then the face is polished to give this two-tone look. Again works very well with the grille and the dark body color nothing that interesting down the side. In fact, these panels look very similar to the previous generation Zoe. And yet, despite there not being any standard door handle, this is a five door car with the door handle hidden up here. I will touch on the passenger space in just a second. We've got a regular aerial on the roof. I believe a shark fin can be ordered for about 200 pounds extra. 
new rear lights also full LED just like all the others at the 50s as I mentioned rear parking sensors and a rear view camera pretty well hidden just above the number plate so hopefully it won't get too dirty in regular use and that's pretty much it on the outside in terms of dimensions between the two cars I had to cheat a bit and look at the official spec sheets the Zoe is a tiny bit longer a tiny bit wider and has a longer wheelbase than the i3 but we are literally talking about millimeters so in terms of parking and maneuvering in the city both are within the sort of typical super mini size the obvious practicality difference compared to the i3 is that the Zoe has regular five doors so if you don't know in the i3 if you want to get into the back you do have rear doors but you need to open the front door first to get into the back the B pillar is not fixed it's a part of the door so it opens with the rear door and it makes fitting child seats in very simple but if you are in a tight parking space with a car next to you it can be kind of tricky if the door is only sort of halfway open and even though you can recline the front seat from here it's not always the easiest once you are in though there is plenty of space so I am 183 centimeters or six feet and as you can see I have plenty of knee room despite this being a fairly compact car I can slide my feet under the seat in front and thanks to this cutout in the roof I have plenty of headroom as well the kind of obvious problem number two after the doors in terms of practicality is that if you look in the middle there is no middle seat the i3 is strictly a four-seater so if you need to carry three people in the back that's not an option while we are talking about practicality i will show you the boot as well by the way yes the front seat was set to my sort of usual driving position the i3 boot is very sort of square and regularly shaped but because the motor and in some cases the range extender lives under the boot floor there is nothing there is no usable storage underneath here so this is pretty much what you get if you need to squeeze a bit more stuff in and you still need to carry four people there is one secret trick on the i3s and that is that you can release the seat and put it into a more upright position so the seat is now fully locked this is not going anywhere and it's perpendicular to the boot floor obviously for the person sitting in the back this is not going to be very comfortable at all but it means that if you need to carry a a large suitcase or something like that you can put the seats a bit more upright and you will still legally squeeze four people in if you need to carry even more stuff you can take the parcel shelf out and fold the seats flat and they split fold and because it's a four seater they split 50 50. for some bizarre reason there is a lot of tie down points in the boot so if you want to get something like a net or you need to strap down something that's totally doable but there are no hooks for your shopping so if you have just a few bags of groceries and you drive dynamically you may have a bit of work putting everything back together when you get back home moving to the Zoe let's start in the back because there is a lot to discuss in the front the Riviera does come with comfort access so you do not need to use the key card to get in but we disable it in the showroom because each time someone walks past the car with the key fob in their pocket the car just freaks out and doesn't know whether to lock or unlock so the first thing I want to point out before I get in is the upholstery all Rivieras get the combination of this dark synthetic leather with the recycled fabric in the middle this is a great combination because it means that the side bolsters should hopefully wear fine and obviously it looks quite premium but the middle is very soft and comfortable and doesn't get too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter 
The floor in the i3 is completely flat because it's a bespoke EV. And let me get the light out. Because this pad is always sharing quite a bit with the Renault Clio, there's a, only a very small hump in the floor. So it's easy to move from one side of the car to the other. In fact, that's what I'm going to do now because I have the driver's seat set to my driving position. You can see that there is very similar amount of knee room in the Zoe compared to the i3. In terms of foot space, also similar. And I can slide my feet under the seat in front. Lastly, in terms of headroom, despite the door opening being a bit lower, the roof does go up inside and there's still plenty of space above my head. If I sit back and all the way straight out, then my hair is just brushing against the ceiling. The big thing is that you can squeeze three people into the back because you have a proper middle seat with seat buckles and a seat belt mounted in the roof for the middle passenger. Moving to the back to show you the boot. It goes a lot deeper than the i3 because the motor in the Zoe is in the front under the bonnet like I showed you earlier. But there is no option of a false floor. So you do have quite a large lip to lift things over. And it's the opposite of the i3 in terms of clever features. So there are no obvious tie down points other than the tethers for the isofix seats. But you do have a little hook on either side of the boot to keep your shopping secure. Unlike the previous generation of the Zoe, this one does have split folding seats, so you can still have some passengers in, even if you want to carry more cargo. Because it's a 5-seater, it's a 60-40 split. And to actually fold them down, there is a little button here. Press that, the seat back releases and just flick it forward. And just like the boot lip, because there is not a false floor, the seat doesn't lie completely flat and there is quite a large hump to lift things over. So if you're planning on carrying a suitcase, you will need to lift it over this edge. But enough of the boring stuff, let's talk about the gadgets. The cockpit has undergone a massive improvement and I would say that it's single-handedly the one biggest jump from the previous Zoe to this one. So I will start from the middle console. You now have an armrest with some storage space on the inside and it's finished in the lovely recycled cloth. The manual parking brake has been replaced by the electronic one which frees up a lot of space and because the Zoe is not really a sports car, it really suits it much better. The old style gear lever has been replaced by a joystick style fully electronic gear selector. We have got two USB ports in the front, an aux in port and a 12 volt socket. Single zone automatic air conditioning. In fact, let me fire the car up so you can see how that looks because the information displays are very nicely integrated into the control dials. So for example, if I want to turn up the fan, I do that by twisting this ring. Temperature and direction of the airflow. These dials and these sort of toggle switches feel very high-end and premium. I will turn that off for now so you can hear me better. The Riviera, just like the sort of GT Line S, which is the top of the range, comes with the bigger infotainment system screen. So if you look from the side, it's a bit easier to see. It extends quite a bit. So the standard system only goes about that far and features a widescreen landscape screen, whereas the top of the range models get this portrait style screen very reminiscent of the Tesla layout. Unfortunately, it's not quite as responsive as the latest Tesla infotainment systems, but to be fair, this is a much cheaper car and it's still perfectly usable. Most of you will probably use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto anyways, 
So let me plug in my phone and I will show you how the layout looks. So if we go into CarPlay, this is probably the first car which I've seen with a portrait style CarPlay. Normally this kind of dock with the icons is on the side, but here it's on the bottom. But you still get your CarPlay features with your dashboard widgets, etc. And you can use Google Maps or Waze for navigation. It's all nice and responsive here, so no complaints. But let me go back to the Renault system because there is something I want to show you. If you want to use the built-in SatNav, it does support Google search, which comes with the car for the first three years and then you will need to pay for it yourself. But it's very convenient because I can just type in any point of interest, like for example, London Bridge, and you can see that the results are displayed through Google. I get Google images if I want to. And once I know that it's the destination I was looking for, I just click go. Turn left after 200 yards, then take the next right turn immediately. And the reason why I'm using the Renault navigation is because I want to show you the new instrument cluster. So it's miles ahead of the old one, which used to be just a letterbox style display. This one has about 10 inches, full color, very nice resolution. It can show you navigation directions, your board computer information and your consumption. You can change tracks and so on. But if you go into the main screen here, into the system settings, I can adjust the style of the display. And if I choose style 3 and scroll down on the steering wheel in the navigation view, I get a full map display showing me the route right in the instrument cluster, just like on Audi models with the virtual cockpit. While we are discussing driving, you can see that the car is estimating 155 miles of range from an almost full battery, but the car has been sitting here for a while, so hopefully that improves as I get on the road. And secondly, the steering wheel has now more adjustment than in the previous version. If I unlock it, not only can I move it up and down, but in and out as well now. Overall, all the control elements, the layout and the materials in the cabin are a huge step up. Just look at this, the entire dashboard is soft touch, which definitely wasn't the case on the older models. In terms of the driver assist feature, we have the already mentioned park assist, which can parallel park bay park, park at an angle which I've not seen on any car previously and get out of a parallel parking space. And the Riviera also gets the full driver assistance system suite with traffic sign recognition, lane departure warning and lane keep assist, blind spot monitoring and autonomous emergency braking. Probably now is the time to address the elephant in the room, and that is the zero star score in the Euro NCAP safety rating. On the surface, it may seem like the car is totally unsafe because who would drive a car with a zero out of five when you can easily get cars which got four or five stars, but it's a bit more nuanced than that. Let's be honest, it's not ideal, but we need to look at why it got the zero star score. There are essentially three main reasons. Number one, as the years go by, the Euro NCAP crash safety testing gets more and more strict. So it's not as easy to achieve five stars now as it was a couple of years ago. So if you are looking at a car which achieved five stars, but wasn't tested in 2021, the set of requirements was quite a bit different compared to now. The second reason is that Renault for some reason has decided to redesign the side front airbag. It's now smaller, which means it doesn't protect your head in case of a side impact, which obviously is not good at all. And Renault should come up with a design which works well for the front occupants. And third reason, and this is probably one of the biggest reasons, is that Euro NCAP tests the base spec of a vehicle. And at the time when they tested the Zoe, it did not come with the suite of driver assist systems as standard, which means no lane keeping, no autonomous emergency braking, 
none of those features. And despite many people thinking it's a gimmick, I would beg to disagree, the active safety systems now get a dedicated category in Euro NCAP. And there is a rule that the total score, so the number of stars the car gets awarded, cannot be higher than the lowest score in any given category. So given the car scored basically zero in the driver assist, there is no chance of the car getting four or five stars again. If Euro NCAP tested a car with the safety pack, like for example this one, the score would definitely be higher than zero, but there is no way around it and no sugar coating, it would still not be five stars because of the removal of the head airbag. What about the i3 then? The i3 was tested by Euro NCAP in 2013. The scores officially last for about eight years, so it's due for a retest anyways. It was awarded four stars back then. BMW threw a bit of a fit because they were expecting five stars, but they were deducted a star for a similar reason to the Zoe, and that is that the i3, just like this one, does not include any of those smart driver assistance features as standard. For that, you need to step up to a car which features the driver assistant plus. You can spot that by the fact that there is a camera in the windscreen, which monitors the traffic situation ahead and can warn you or slam on the brakes if it thinks that you are about to crash into someone. Even with that system present, I can pretty much guarantee that the car would not score the same four stars as it did in 2013, because even unlike the Zoe, the BMW system is only camera based. Keep in mind that it was revolutionary back then, but it doesn't work very well in bad weather conditions because of the lack of radar in the front and it can only detect pedestrians during the day. Now the requirement is that all of these cars are supposed to detect other vehicles, pedestrians and cyclists both during daytime and nighttime or in reduced visibility. Same goes for the fact that the i3 does not officially really have any kind of a lane departure warning system, whereas the Zoe with the safety pack now does. What I'm trying to say is that both cars could be better, but we are living in a day and age where even a car with a very low Euro NCAP safety score is much safer than something you would have been driving 15 years ago. So enough talking, as I promised, let's go for a very quick test drive. I haven't properly driven one of these newer Zoe's yet, so we will see how it feels. Okay, I've driven a couple of hundred meters. I am genuinely quite impressed. So the underpinnings are very similar to the previous generation, but the car feels noticeably more refined, especially over bumps. The steering is obviously tuned to be very light and comfortable in the city, so it's not extremely communicative, but it's perfectly suitable for this class of a car. Despite it having the driver assistance systems, there is unfortunately no adaptive cruise control which is a bit bizarre because you would assume that once the hardware is in, Renault will try to sort of upsell you because the software for it these days is not that expensive. One note I forgot to mention was that the car, when you put it into drive, it drives just like a regular automatic. So it creeps forward when you let off the brake pedal and there is a ve very little regenerative braking happening. But there is now option of a B mode which remaps the throttle pedal to include region braking. So the moment I lift off the accelerator, there is a pretty strong braking effect. It's still not quite one pedal driving like the i3, because for example, as I try to come to a stop here, I need to touch the brake pedal, because otherwise the car would just keep on creeping forward. Auto hold is engaged though, as shown in the instrument cluster, so now I can let go of the brake pedal and the car will keep holding the brakes for me. When the lights turn green, I will simply have to tap the accelerator and I will be off again. Yep, just like that. It 
it's a shame the noise generator is so loud because even when I'm doing 17 miles an hour you can still hear it inside but in terms of tone it's very similar to the previous generation of the Zoe. The only feature which I'm really missing in this kind of weather are the heated seats. I don't quite know the logic behind not including them in this Riviera edition which is pretty much a fully spec car otherwise. Um, but I guess the saving grace is that the Zoe has a heat pump so even if you are using the cabin heater in the winter the range does not suffer too badly. The heat pump is also available on the i3 but it's a very rare option so unless you are buying a brand new car the chances of getting it are pretty slim. But yeah, these speed bumps, very nicely filtered. The suspension is definitely tuned for comfort, but if you want an everyday car, this Zoe just makes perfect sense. The i3 is definitely a bit more sporty. Uh, it handles a bit nicer. Because of it being rear wheel drive, I'm sure that if you really start pushing it, it will be a lot more confident than this Zoe. But overall, I'm quite happy. Yeah, despite the similar wheelbase, the i3, even though it doesn't get too upset by these bumps, it definitely is not as soft and compliant as the Zoe. So yeah, the i3 is for you if you prefer a sportier ride and more of a focus on handling. And the Zoe is a great option if you just want to cruise around the city or on the motorways in comfort. Yeah, and it definitely still has plenty of pep if you want to merge into traffic or overtake. I want to turn into this street because honestly I would like to see how the park assist feature works. So let's say, let's turn it on. Parlor parking here and let's say that I'm looking for parking space. space. Okay, so it already found one. But I would like to go into this one to make it a bit more challenging. Lovely. Stop, look in all directions. Yes, I've done the reverse. And back up. Oh, it's an auto hold. It's going really close to that car. So I hope it doesn't do anything stupid. I want to make sure I don't curb the wheels because they are in pretty pristine condition. Let's adjust the mirror. Oh, and it's telling me how far to back up. Okay, drive. Reverse. Maneuver complete. Let's put it into park and let's see how it looks from the outside. Yeah, I'm happy with that. The only difference is that unlike the i3, um, you still need to control the accelerator and the brake and selecting the gears but it can do more maneuvers so now let's say that I want to exit the parking space onto the right reverse what do you mean unavailable drive 
This should be a lot easier, shouldn't it? Yes, I want to go out. Okay. So I meant to go forward. I'm oh. I'm checking that there's no one coming. Okay. Reverse. Drive. Nobody coming. You should. Oh my god, it wants me to do what? Oh. I'm pretty sure we would have made it, but whatever. Doing this for the science. <laughs> Maneuver complete. Honestly, if you can't do this, you probably should not have a driver's license, but hey-ho, I like my gadgets. Time to head back in. Yeah, I don't know whether it's just the placebo, but not just the quieter suspension and more refined cabin, but all of the controls, the way they feel, they just make the car feel a lot more premium than the previous generation. So yeah, well done. Yeah, and even the little things like how it transitions from auto hold to creeping on a hill much improved. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Done. Let me collect my thoughts and I will talk to you in a second. And you can't forget the Zoe still has the Chameleon charger so it can charge up to 22 kilowatts using the motor basically in reverse as a charger. It's a very clever design, reduces the number of components you need and is one of the ways it manages to keep the cost down yet offer such fast charging rate on AC. Let me conclude today then by summarizing the differences between the Zoe and the i3. Obviously they are meant for a different market the i3, I would say, is a much sportier car, not only in terms of the raw power available, but in terms of handling, the suspension setup and so on. It's also a bit more quirky with a more futuristic design, which has aged very well, despite being on the market for almost a decade now, but it does come with its compromises. The Zoe, on the other hand, is now just a very nice all-around compact car, it seats 5, has a big boot, charges pretty quickly, especially on AC, very good range and efficiency, there is not much to complain about. It's a bit of a shame about the safety, because otherwise it would be an excellent all-rounder, but it will still be a fantastic option for many families. And keep in mind that when you are comparing the two and reading up on different reviews, it's not as much of a case of which car is better at this point, because there is no such thing as a bad car in 2022, it's more about which car suits you better, so it's only up to you to decide which one you want to go for. It's past five, so officially the time to close the shutter and start heading home. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video. Bye bye.